there, but you chose to be here, and may God richly bless you for it. It appears to me that Wednesday night seems to be garnering a few more faces, as well as Sundays. How many of you was with us on Sunday? Let me see your hand. Amen. Unshakable faith. And God just really blessed us uh, with a powerful uh, message, uh, an anointing from on high to preach it, and um, I'm so excited about it. Let me take just a brief moment to tell you a little bit about what's going on, and that is life group sign-ups are happening right now. Today is the 20th, um, so we're uh, most of the way, or at least uh, uh, two-thirds of the way through the month of, of of May, I just can't comprehend it, but nonetheless it is. And uh, May is our fill, F-I-L-L, -L, month. In other words, we, uh, we have a month where we focus, this is just the staff people, focus on life groups, what we're going to offer. Then there's a month, uh, the following month we form it, and uh, that's when we match up uh, our facilitators, coordinators, and hosts with the life group and the coaches and all of that good stuff. So we focus on topics and then we form it, each of those taking a month. And then right now we're in the fill month where we're filling up those sheets. And this one here is almost full. That one's halfway full. That's a third of the way. So you need to jump in. I see another that's about a third of the way and two-thirds of the way or better, three-quarters. So jump in. Uh, jump in somewhere. And uh, I want to tell you this, life groups is the fastest way to get connected into the church. Because I'll just be quite honest with you, nobody has time on Sunday mornings because most people get to church. I want to commend y'all because all y'all get here on time. I know there's nobody here right now that would be late on Sunday. But all those other people that's late on Sunday, they don't have time to fellowship with nobody because they get here after service starts and they got to scurry on in. Right? And you know you don't have time after church because you're ready to go eat. And so, so you don't have a whole lot of time to fellowship. And then on Wednesday nights, a lot of folks are working, and typically you have, if you can run half on Wednesday night what you run on Sunday morning, you, you're doing good. Now, we run around 160 or so uh, because, obviously, our youth service is on Sunday night, which would be on Wednesday night, so we're able to count that. But um, nonetheless, um, what I'm saying is you don't have time to really get to know each other like you do when you come to life group. We go to life groups. Then you've got an hour and a half, uh, and some of you may get there a smidge earlier or whatever if you work that out with your host. And... Uh, you get to spend, you know, 15 minutes or so, maybe 20, just sort of chewing the fat, drinking some coffee, drinking a Pepsi, and talking about life. And that's where you get to know each other. And we have had a number of people. I'm telling you, Life Groups is, in fact, uh, the Golden Isles Church of God uh, on exit 38, the big church right on the side, my pastor is there, Pastor Ray Dawson. He brought his entire staff down with us, spent the whole day with us on Monday. Uh, to talk about how we do life groups, and uh, because they're about to launch, uh, I don't know if they're going to call it growth groups, life groups, island groups, or whatever, I don't know, but nonetheless, they're interested, and they're going to do something there. So um, I'm excited about what God's doing. It is a way to get plugged in. I could take you through uh, the life group that I had the privilege of hosting this last time, the Holy Spirit Life Group, and by the way, if you are uh, wondering, that, that's the best one, just jump right in it. It's going to fill up quick. It's almost there. I know I'm partial, and, and I would expect every life group leader to get up here and tell you theirs is the best. I mean, it don't mean it's right, but no. <laughs> I'm on. I, I promise you I'm teasing, but uh, nonetheless, in that life group, we had people that was barely on the fringe of the crowd on Sunday morning. They were kind of loners. And by the end of the life group, they were having a great time. All of them laughed at me when I busted my behind at the bowling alley. Amen. I'm telling them I wiped it out, bro. And you said, no, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. And then Brother Glenn laughed at me, and next thing you know, he did. Huh? Only thing different was I was able to get up. We had to call the ambulance. No, we didn't call the ambulance. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so, so get hooked up with a life group. Uh, and even if you look at one that's filled up, talk to us. We, we'll, um, 
we, we, we still have several weeks. But you need to get signed up. I don't want to make you think there's all kinds of time. Normally we allow sign up for the first three weeks of groups because the first meeting is always just getting to know everybody in the group. And then they normally set the course and get on with it. I know the Holy Spirit Life group is a full, I mean, it is a bumping full semester. But we have a great time. And uh, I'm going to tell you something. I've been doing this a long time, and I learned a lot in that life group. So I encourage you to, to get involved. I've had the privilege of having my mom and dad with me for the last uh, 11 days, actually. I took them home yesterday. Got pulled over by GST going home. And coming back. And one thing about me, baby, you can say I'm consistent. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I consistently got warnings both times. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I really felt bad. You know why I felt bad? Because I shouldn't be speeding. And, you know, I, I probably, I'm near the altar. I ought to be praying about that. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it's so ironic to get 71 to 55. 71 to 55. Almost the same time of day, 24 hours later. And you know, the first guy, he was so nice. I'm telling you, he was nice. He could be probably mid-50s, late-50s or something anyway. He said, can I get you to slow down? I said, you sure can. <laughs> so he went back and he wrote my warning. He brought it up and handed me his autographed copy. And uh, uh, I folded and put it away. And then this morning on the way back, I was rolling through Sumter County, America, Georgia, just on the other side. The other one was Tiff County. And lo and behold, that pretty shiny new car. I just helped pay for it. These new GSP cars. <laughs> Low profile lights, man. You can't even see them. And all of a sudden, I saw him dart. I said, Lord, have mercy. We're fixing to talk again. So he showed me that it could run, man. He kept right on up to me and blue lighted me. So I pulled over. Just as nice a guy as you ever seen in your life. He was really nice. And he says, uh, Mr. Sainz, I clocked you 71 to 55. I wanted to say something like, yeah, the same guy. I mean, there's a guy yesterday in a car just like that did the same thing. Matter of fact, I got a little note from him. I didn't say that, though. And he seemed so nice to me. He said, um, is there any kind of reason or explanation where you headed? I said, well, to be honest with you, I'm headed back to Kingsland, Georgia. I got to be on a conference call <laughs> with some pastors because I'm a pastor. <laughs> I was supposed to be there. I said, but I'm going to tell you the truth now. I, I, I was speeding, and you know that, and there ain't no excuse for it. I just told him just like it is. He said, well, sit tight. So he comes back, and um, he says, I'm, uh, I'm going to give you another warning. But while he was walking back to his car, the thought hit me. I looked at Kelly. I said, you know what? This guy right here was about to let me go and give me a warning. But when he goes back and pulls that thing up, because they print them out right now, baby. It ain't no little yellow ticket book no more. They got the system right I said, when he pulls that up and sees that they talked to me yesterday, he's going to walk back up here and tell me, yesterday was your warning, Mr. Sane, <laughs> and today you get both of them. But I was ready to see him coming. I said, oh, Lord, has he put that smoky bear hat on? <laughs> he come on back and said, slow it down for me, all right? Have a nice day. And that time I did slow down. I set cruise control on 65 and let it rip. <laughs> Anyway, I'll try to do my speeding when I'm skydiving, but uh, y'all pray for me. Um, the good that I would do, I find that sometimes I don't. And uh, anyway, I've canceled enough sinners out here. To <laughs> anyway, um, I do thank the Lord for our officials, and uh, I was really blessed. I deserved a ticket both times, but uh, I was blessed. Unshakable faith. Let me, let me get into Something a little stronger. <laughs> this past Sunday I talked with you and I wanted to talk with you about David. And I wanted to talk with you about his faith when he, when he looked Goliath in the eye. And he had a resilient faith that said, you've defied the armies of the Lord God of Israel. And you've come out against me, uh, you, know, with a, you know, with a sword and a stave and a spear. But I come to you in the name of the Lord. Uh, of the, the Lord of Israel that you've defied. And today, I will take your head off your shoulders. And of course, Goliath laughed and mocked and sneered. I wanted to talk with you about that. And the Lord said, no, only Abraham. I wanted to talk with you about other great um, 
men of faith in the Bible that sat in prison and believed God for, um, for His will to be done, and they praised God, and they sang to God, and prison doors opened, and oh, what great faith. I wanted to talk with you about men like Job that, that uh, was the richest man in all the East, and, and, and in a, a day, he lost all of his livestock, all of his, everything he had, everything that represented money was gone. And near the close of the day, he found out that all ten of his children also were gone. And with an all, uh, just an awesome faith in God, he said, I came to this world with nothing and I'll leave with nothing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God has given and God has taken away. And I thought about the measure of faith that it took to say something like that. To uh, When his wife told him that, you know, uh, why don't you just curse God and die? And, but he said things like, I know that my Redeemer lives. And though the skin worms devour this body, yet in my flesh shall I seek God and not another. Oh, those are great stories of faith. But God wouldn't let me get away from Abraham, that we know him as the father of faith. The Bible says he staggered not at the promise of God and considered not his body dead when he was a hundred years old, nor the deadness of his wife Sarah's womb. But he believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness' sake. And I took you through the Bible where in Genesis 12, God said, Leave Ur of the Chaldeans and go to a city whose builder and maker is myself, whose builder and maker is God. I took you through all of that. I wish I had time. But here's what you need to do. Log on to harborwc.com, click on media, and the first thing that pops up will be unshakable faith from last Sunday. Just listen to it in its entirety. It will bless you. In chapter 12, he left. Where are you go in Abraham? I'm looking for a city whose builder maker is God. He was rich. He was, he was wealthy. He had a, uh, uh, affiliations. He had all of this, and he walked away from it all with an unshakable uh, faith in God, following after God, believing God as he left his people. And then in chapter number 15, the Lord took him out one night underneath the stars of the heavens and said, Abram, if you could count the stars in the sky tonight, you would know what your offspring would be like. And he's, you know, he, he's thinking, come on, God, I, I go childless, and, and there's a slave in my house by the name of Eliezer, and yet you're telling me, but God says, if you could count them, that'll be your descendants. And then in chapter 17, he comes back, and he tells him again. And then in chapter 18, he tells him again. And Sarah laughs in the tent door. Even Abraham himself laughed. But nonetheless, as promised by the Lord, a year later, she gives birth, and um, he does become the father of a great, great nation. And I told you basically four things. I want to get to this next part tonight, but that your faith would be tested, and you had to know that because if you don't get that, you're going to lose heart and lose hope. And then I wanted you to put your faith in God like our father Abraham did, and um, because if we do that, we're not going to be ashamed. And uh, um, then... If we do that, we can live with great confidence in God and His ability to keep us, and we can live with great faith. And I, I challenge you to take a step of faith and allow that to become a walk of faith and then a journey of faith. Are you with me? Say amen. And then here's what I want you to know as we jump in tonight to Daniel uh, chapter 3, um, that if you will take a step of faith, if you will take a stand of faith. Remember this? Oh, there's so many things I could go here. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the Word of God. But how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach unless they are sent? I, I, I talk to people sometimes who are struggling with their faith, but they never come to the house of God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the Word of God, but if all we ever listen to is junk and trash, we don't hear anything uplifting. We hang out with negative people. Listen, you cannot do that and stay positive. You cannot read trash all the time and stay on the right path. You cannot. Faith comes by hearing. By hearing what? By hearing the Word of God. So read the Word when you rise up early. Read the Word before you go to bed. Listen to the Word as you're traveling down the road. Listen to some great anointed preacher. 
or listen to some dry preacher. But hear something. Are you with me? Hey, I've gotten something out of dead preachers. I can, I can still gather something from the Word of God. If I want to listen, I can get something out of it. So, but here's what I challenge you to do. Faith will lead to resolve. I'm not talking about the carpet cleaner. Faith will lead to resolve. And resolve will bring results. You know, when, when we write a resolution, I don't know if you've ever been in a, a, a like, for instance, the General Assembly uh, or a general corporation when they have their, uh, their corporate meeting, they have guys and ladies, smart people, put together the language of a resolution. And the language of the resolution will say something like this, be it resolved that, or be it further resolved that. In other words, we have come to a place, we've come to a resolution as to our position on whatever it may be. And I'm saying we need unshakable faith. And I'm saying when we take a step of faith, when we listen and we hear God's voice, and we begin to act on God's Word, and I told you this, Sonny, and I'll just say it again because I think it's worth saying it, you're never going to steal second with your foot on first. There are people that are waiting forever and ever and ever to try something. Scared to death to let go. I'm going to tell you something. You're never going to swim across the deep end unless you let go of the rail over here. But I might drown. But you might swim. Amen? Listen, let me say something to you. I remember when I was a youngster, I went to the Columbus Boys Club. And we had an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and it's a pretty good-sized swimming pool. And they done a swim test every day to see who could go on the deep end. And there was a big rope right here with the floats and all this stuff. And in order to go on that end of the pool, which was 12 foot deep, you had to pass a swim test. That means the lifeguards put all the boys on one side of the pool. And everybody that wanted to go to the diving board or go in the deep end, they got groups of about 12 of us or 15, lined us up, and they'd blow the whistle. You'd dive in and swim to the other side. If you made it to the other side without stopping, you were allowed to go in the deep end. Are you with me? But you had to do the swim test or you couldn't go in the deep end. Or you had to leave the pool if they caught you in the deep end. And, and, and the thing of it is this, is more times than one, I saw guys who wanted to go out there but were scared. They stood on the wall and when they went and blowed the whistle, they dove in there. And with everything, they, they swam as hard as they could swim and wasn't hardly getting nowhere. And guess what? They had to pop up. Lifeguard had to say, hey, it's all right, man. You can try it again tomorrow. But at least they tried. At least they said, hey. But what I'm saying is this. For us to sit in the security of, of where we're at and say, Lord, I, I feel led to do this. I feel called of God to do this. I, the Bible says, try the Spirit. See if it's of God. Dive out there. He's got some lifeguards. If you start flailing around, somebody will come get you. Amen. But at least try. You'll never know until you try. So, faith leads to resolve. Resolve will bring results. Now, turn with me to Daniel chapter number 3. In fact, it was y'all should have really caught on to this. I was able somehow, I don't know how I've done this, was able to confine Sunday to Abraham. Wow. And he was the father of faith. He did not stagger, but he believed God. And then I've told you about how later his son, he continued to believe God. So, man, I could have done an entire series on, uh, just on unshakable faith and took each one of these. However, let me plug for Sunday morning. We're going to talk about unshakable bonds. And you do not want to miss this great message this coming Sunday, unshakable bonds. And we'll talk about that on Sunday. But here I want to take you to Daniel chapter 3. We're going to find the story. In fact, I'd like to take you to 3 and Daniel chapter 6, but I don't know that we'd have time to do both. Uh, all of these guys are deportees. Are you all with me? These are Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, of course, Daniel. All of these guys were deported to the Persian Empire. They came to Jerusalem and took the brightest, the smartest, the most intelligent. They took those people and carried them back. Are you with me? To their own empire. And Daniel literally ended up uh, in a high position 
uh, as well as, in fact, every time we see things like this, we see Nehemiah, he found himself in a high position. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they decide uh, that they're going to stand in unshakable faith, unshakable resolve, and I believe Daniel the same way. But let me take it from chapter 3 and just look with me at the screen there. Nebuchadnezzar, the king in Babylon here, had made an uh, image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and his width was 6 cubits. And he put it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And the king Nebuchadnezzar sent word to the, to gather, to, uh, he sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and the officials of the province to come to the dedication. Now, all of these terms, all it is, is all of the political gurus of his empire. It, it just, just understand that. All the politicians go. Bring all of them to the dedication of the image that the king had set up. So all of these people, the satraps, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, officials, and the prophets, they gather together for the, dedica for the dedication of the dedicatorial service of this golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before this image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and a herald cried. Now, a herald is, is uh, someone, we used to call them criers. Uh, you, you remember back, way back in the day, some of you when newspapers was kind of the only deal. I don't remember it, but some of you all might. And uh, they would shout, you know, that extra, extra, read all about it. They were criers. They were heralds. Are you with me? heralding the news, uh, you know, of, of the nation or of the city or, or wherever it is that, that they're at. But a herald cried out, and he says to them, because obviously they did not have printed paper that they were, uh, I mean, they didn't have email blasts to do it and a text blast and uh, all of that. So he had certain guys employed in the kingdom, and their job was to herald the news. So he says to them, you are commanded, O peoples, all you nations, languages, that at the time that you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, the symphony, with all the kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And watch this. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. How many of you remember the tornado drills? They still have them in some places, but when I was in Columbus, Georgia, they had a number of different sirens, uh, sirens that was posted all over the, the city, and at 12 o'clock every Saturday, that, that tornado horn or siren would go off. And it lasted one minute. And it scared the bejesus out of you. If you've ever been in the midst of a tornado uh, or, or bad weather. Um, but every Saturday at 12 o'clock, that thing went off. And then you knew when it was really, really real because the sky had darkened and it was bad. And all of a sudden when they sounded that, that meant that a tornado had been spotted in our area. And so, anyway... So right here, now I don't know that they've got that kind of a, a warning system, but they're heralding the news saying, hey, in the middle of town, a golden image has been erected, and there's going to be a sound that's going to come. It's going to be the symphony, and when, when, when they strike it up, everybody in this whole empire, everybody here, is to bow before the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And if you don't do it, the punishment will be a burning, fiery furnace for you. Verse 7 says, So at the time when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the symphony, and all the kinds of music, all the people in the nations and languages fell down and worshipped the gold image that the king Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And I want to tell you something. I want to contrast that with our society today. The world, King Nebuchadnezzar said, worship what I have made. He said it, and that's all he did. He just said it. And the whole place, and of course he threatened them, and the, the whole world swooned after it. As soon as he said, fall down and worship it, when the sound happened, 
all of them just begin to follow suit and just begin to worship because they said worship. Except some people, some Jewish people, there was a sect of those Jewish people that knew better. They, had, they were deportees from Jerusalem. And it's kind of like, uh-uh, baby. Y'all can do what you want to here, but we don't do it like this back home. We serve God. We serve a God that said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. We serve a God that said, I'm a jealous God. We serve a God that says, Don't bow before any graven image. Uh, don't, don't fall prostrate before anybody else. He said, But I am the Lord your God. And they simply said, You know what? We just cannot do this. Verse 8 says, Therefore at the time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused. Here's what I want you to know. You better get this. Look at your neighbor and just say it. They're always going to be tattletales. Now these Jews are in a foreign place. They're in Babylon now. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar has um, uh, made this image and they're supposed to be bowing down, but he's not going to have any of it. There will always be people that will tell on you. Trust me. And these people said, you know, old king, those Jews, there's some people down here, they have no regard for what you've said. Let's just read it. They spoke to the king, said, Nebuchadnezzar, oh, live forever. O king, you have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, the symphony, with all the kinds of music there to fall down and worship the golden image, and whoever does not fall down shall be cast in the midst of a burning fire. See, they knew what he said. And they were reminding him of what he had said. There are certain Jews, talking about racism, it goes on back. Are you all with me? Say amen. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the prophets. You see, when Nebuchadnezzar went in, I said Persian Empire, but ba Babylonian. Uh, rather, I'm confusing Nehemiah, uh, so forgive me of that. Xerxes led the Persian Empire, but Nebuchadnezzar was Babylon. So anyway, they deported all of these guys that were the brains of Jerusalem and set them over. And I imagine that kind of made a little angst among some of the people that was there to have these foreigners leading over them. He said, but some of the people you put in position in the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, do not regard you. They pay no regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you've set up. And then Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men to the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true? Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods? And I want you to notice that G is lowercase. My gods, or worship the gold image which I have set up. Um, is it true that, that you're not going to worship this? Now, if you're ready, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, the symphony, with all kinds of music, you'll fall down and worship the image which I've made, he said, what the bottom line is, I'm going to give you an opportunity now to just do it right here in front of me. Come in the office and you can do it here. You ain't got to do it out there. I'll give you another chance. If you'll just do that, we'll just call this thing good. We'll go back out and tell them that everybody bowed down and we're okay. I thank God for a few Jewish men that had integrity. Now, I'm going to tell you what a lot of people now Nowadays will do. They say, well, I was under the, under the gun, and God understands, and they went in there and bowed down. Went in there and told that lie. See, because nowadays we live in a society, as long as we get our behind out of hot water, we'll just pray about it later. Y'all with me? Come on, I know. I done heard it. I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I, so now if you're ready, at the same time you hear the sound and all of this stuff, he says, I'm going to give you another chance. And it'll all be good. But if you do not worship, if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God? Lowercase g again. And who is the God, verse 15, who will deliver you from my hands? Just a little bit arrogant. Just a little bit cocky. He says, and who is the God? That will deliver you out of my hands. 
But what they didn't realize was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they spelled God with a capital G. Because there is no God but Jehovah. Amen? That they understood him to be God and God alone. Let me read further. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered, and here they said, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, in other words, if what you've said about the fiery furnace and all that stuff, and being able to deliver us out of your hands and all that stuff, if, if all that's the case, so be it. He says, but okay, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, capital G, whom we serve. In other words, I don't know who you serve. You didn't, I mean, his name don't even have a capital G. I don't know who it is that you serve. He said, but the one that we serve, he said, he is able. He is able. I, I, do you see the reckless abandon right here? Do you see the unshakable faith right here? Do you understand the threat? It'd be real easy just close the door and let nobody else see it. There's a couple of captains and lieutenants in here, and there's the king. Just sort of do a little quick, deep knee bend, bow, whatever, get up and call it good. And they said, no, it's just not in our DNA. We just can't do it. We cannot bow before any God but Jehovah. We, in other words, we have resolved it. Be it resolved, O king. <laughs> Be it resolved that we will not bow our knees, no matter what instrument you play, no matter how long you play it, and no matter how hot you make that furnace. We have resolved the fact that we might die, but we will not bow. Let, let me read it on for you. Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. He's, oh, let me back up. The God we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. I like this language. What he says is this. Even if we die, what we want you to know, king, is this. He still has delivered us out of your hands. And while we were in your hands... We ain't bowing. So, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image that you've set up. In other words, the, the phraseology is this, be it therefore resolved. <laughs> we will not worship any other god. So, Verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. I will say this to you. When you resolve in your heart that you are going to serve God, what do you mean by that? I resolve that I'm going to read the Word of God. I've resolved that I'm going to bring my family to the house of God. I've resolved that I'm going to get my financial house in order. I've resolved that I'm going to pursue ministry. Or I'm going to, when you resolve that in your mind, you can guarantee Hell is going to show itself in your life. Believe it. But if you hold on, amen, stay resolute. Keep the faith. Be unshakable, immovable, always abounding. Hey, I'll tell you something. I, I told you this Sunday, unshakable faith don't mean that we're not going to be. I, I told you about that palm tree that, you know, that it'll bend over and kiss the ground and stand right back up. So here I am again. The resolve, the resiliency that is there. So here we go. Nebuchadnezzar was mad. The expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How many of you, you can look at somebody's face and you know when they done got mad? Come on. He spoke and he commanded, heat up the furnace seven times hotter than it would usually be heated. He commanded certain mighty men of valor. Another translation, translation says his strongest warriors. He, he, he got those guys. He said, get, get the baddest boys we got. Get the strong guys, the men of valor. Come in here to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them in the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats. They, they, didn't, let, they, didn't, they didn't strip them down or anything, but they were in their coats. They were in their trousers. 
their turbans, and their other garments, and they were cast in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed the men that took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In other words, when they opened up the door leading into the furnace, the heat killed the cert team that took them down there. Are y'all with me? Let me go on. And these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Now, you know what? Boy, there's a lot of preaching right here. They opened that up, and the way it seems to read to me was the, the entrance may have been from above, where they kicked this thing open, and the heat bellowing out slew the men that carried them down there. But however it was, they pushed these men in, and they fell to the bottom, and there they are tied up in the midst of a burning, flaming fiery furnace. Now everybody wants to go around the fire. Everybody wants to be delivered from, but God sometimes wants to lead you through. It will take great resolve to walk with God through the fire. It'll take great resolve and great faith, the unshakable faith, to say, okay, God, if you'll go with me, I'll go through the fire. I'm going to tell you something. You can go around the fire, but there'll be times you've got to go through it. There's something that the fire will do that going around it won't. Amen? When you come out of the fire, a fire has a way of burning out the impurities. Fire has a way of cleaning up that that needs to be cleaned up. Fire has a way of purging out that that needs to get out. So they went through the fire, and guess what? Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he arose in haste. And spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Now, I don't know. I'd like to think that Nebuchadnezzar had a window, perhaps, like uh, some, some men do in their offices, where he could slide something back and just peer in there. And I don't know. It might have been a great distance. But, but he looked through a glass at some point, or a window at some point, and he was astonished. And he rose up in haste, and he said to his counselors, didn't we put three men in? They said, yes, we did. And he answered and said, they said, true, O, o king. But he says, look, I see four men, loose, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, let me, let me do a little mycology here. I see four men. They're loosed, unfettered, unbound, walking around and having a party in what was meant to be their place of death and burial. They were supposed to be killed by the fire and they're dancing in it. Wouldn't it be great to have a party in the place that was supposed to kill you? I see four men, they're loose. They're walking in the midst of a fire. They're not hurt. And, and, the, and the fourth one looks like the Son of God. Now, I ain't figured this out just yet other than by revelation from God. Because Jesus had not yet been born on this earth. Are you all with me? Now, I preached this the other day. And about Jesus being with God and with the Holy Spirit when they said, come let us make man in our image. And so he created them, male and female. He created, or they created them, right? Are you with me? And um, they said, well, I didn't never know that Jesus was alive before Bethlehem. Oh, yes. He took off his robe of divinity and laid it aside and put on the robe of humanity and come in the form of a servant. He come as a man and took on the pain of this world and, and this flesh and nailed sin to the cross. Wow. Okay. So, but he says, I, how, did, how did Nebuchadnezzar know what the Son of God looked like? That's what I'm going to ask you in a quick, short way. Because he had not yet been revealed. But he said, lo, I see, we threw three men, but I see four men. Our men died throwing them in there. That's a hot fire, man. That's hotter, seven times hotter than we've ever made it. But these guys are down there having a party, and that last man looks like God's son. 
God has a way of revealing himself in your deepest, darkest trial. In the fire and in the heat and in the hottest days of your life, he can reveal himself. Wow. Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning, fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, me, shake it, let me go. I want you to listen to the change. Servants of the Most High God. Spelling it now with a capital. M, Most, capital, High God. Servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. In other words, I, I, I want to I wanna hug you boys. I want to know who the God is y'all serving because he's bad. Uh, he's, he's bigger than my God. And he is he said, come out, come here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the king's counselors gathered together. In other words, all the politicians got there. They saw these men whose bodies, watch this, the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed. Hey, I lit the barbecue grill the other day and singed the hair on my hand. <laughs> Are y'all with me? That's right. He said, this man, he did the, the furnace. I'm talking about a death chamber that they killed guys, uh, rogues. They killed them, heated up seven times hotter. And the Bible said they walked on the fiery coals and loose, unbound, walking in the midst of flames. Let me tell you something. God is the only one that can suspend his laws. You've heard me talk about gravity because I like heights and all that stuff. There is a law called gravity, and only God can stop that law. You say, well, I defy the law of gravity. Climb up on that cross and jump off. I'll preach your funeral next week because gravity will bring you smoke into the earth, I promise you. You can deny the existence of gravity all you want to. You can deny the heat of fire, but let me tell you something. When you get in the fire, you're going to burn. Unless God suspends it. How many of you know? I don't know. I know some of y'all probably think that you walked on water, but I doubt it. How many of you know in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus was sitting on the side of a mountain talking to his father. He had already sent his disciples to get into a boat and go to Bethsaida, to the other side of the sea. In the middle of the, the night, the storm become tempestuous. And I mean, it looked like they was going to lose the boat. They started throwing tackling out. They threw fish out. They threw everything out. I mean, it was terrible. And somewhere in the fourth watch of the night, defying the laws of gravity, defying the laws uh, uh, of everything known to man, here comes Jesus walking. I'm not talking about on four millimeters of water. I'm talking about walking on the Sea of Galilee on which I have sailed. Amen. And uh, he come walking to him in the fourth watch of the night on the water. He is the only one that can suspend the laws of gravity, the laws of thermodynamics, the laws of this and that and the other. Why? Because he holds this world in the hollow of his hand. He tells the sun to stand still, and he tells the ocean waves where enough is enough. <laughs> so he alone is God. And beside him is no other. So these men, uh, uh, fire has not touched. Let me tell you something. Not only did it not burn them. Let's read further. He says, uh, their bodies, the fire had no power. The hair of their head was not singed. Nor their garments affected. And the smell of fire was not on them. Now, when I cooked steak the other night, I smelt like I'd been cooking steak. Are y'all with me? Every time I light my barbecue grill up, I, I can't help but smell like smoke. And I didn't get in the firebox. The Bible says, but they didn't even smell like smoke. They're, I mean, can you imagine they smelled just, probably just like they got out of the shower? Their hair wasn't burned. The hands wasn't burned. The clothes, I mean, the clothes would normally just go. Let me tell you something. I know I serve a God who is able. I have watched God suspend the laws in my own life. When I was in Claxton, Georgia, I'll never forget this, the longest day I lived, I was frying fish on my back porch on one of them grandpappies. 
You know what I'm talking about? The big, and I mean it's hot. We have fish frying up, French fries and all this. We got done, and I took it off of that because I didn't want kids to knock it over. Walked over and for whatever reason, sat it on the edge of the porch. It had not been four or five minutes later, A.J., a little tot at the time, walked by, got on his knees, and stuck his hand to the bottom of that pan. Scared the living daylights out of me. I thought his flesh would melt off his arm. Didn't even turn red. I couldn't touch that pot. You hear me? I'm telling you, I stuck my hand in there and pulled my hand right back out. Burn you like no other. I thought he's going to be scarred for life. I've seen guys who got burned in restaurant industries where the, 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 the flesh literally melted into the grease. He has no scar today on his hand. God has the power to suspend the laws. He has the power to suspend the laws. That's, how, that's why he could say to the Christian, if you do drink any deadly thing, God says, I've got the power to reverse it. If you happen to be bitten, I'm not talking about those fools picking up snakes in church. I watched that. My mom and dad was here, and we pulled up YouTube, and uh, Adam wanted to show it to me, and I said, oh, Lord. I, I mean, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. Um, God hadn't told me to do that. <laughs> and if he tells any of y'all to do it, find that church and go to it. But you ain't bringing them here. Amen. Anyway, that's not what he's talking about. There's never a scripture where he says, you know, you do something like that and then, you know, you're all, no, no. But I'm telling you, I want to stay on track. God has the ability to suspend the laws. And I'm going to tell you, he can suspend the laws. Um, Lord, time would fail me to tell you the times where I've seen God do some things that was just incredible. So anyway, let's look at this change of heart before we go. Uh, the fire had no power over them. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of, uh, of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent, what's this? Here's a wicked king who said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent an angel. He knew it had to be God, who sent an angel and delivered his servants, who did what? Who trusted him. I had an opportunity to talk to my pastor yesterday, uh, Monday. He come and spent the day with us and he said, Mike, I want to tell you something. Faith is easy. Trust is what's hard to do. Faith, is, oh, well, we've got confidence but to just reach out and trust. And he defined it in such a way you should have heard the explanation. Maybe I'll get it for you next week. He said, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he says, God sent his angel. He delivered you who trusted him. And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar says, I make a decree that any nation, people, or language which speaks anything amiss against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, shall be cut in pieces. And their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Hey, this was the king saying it, because there is no other God that can deliver like this. Let me say this to you. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. As you stand with me tonight, here's what I want you to know. If you'll stand with unshakable faith, unshakable resolve, listen to me, you'll have results like this. Is your faith going to be tested? Absolutely. Will you have to go through the fire at some point in your life? Yes, you will. Abraham's faith was tested for 25 years and then... When the boy was about 17 years old, God tested him again. Let me say this. We're never going to get to a point where we're just out of the woods and we just graduated and never have another faith test. Amen? But I'll say this. If you put your resolve in the Lord and say, you know what? 
He alone is my God. He's my rock. He's my deliverer. He's my redeemer. You're not going to be ashamed. You're going to go through some times that you're going to stand flat-footed and say, you know what? Though he slay me, Job said, yet will I trust him. And when you have that kind of resolve, that kind of faith, God's going to show up for you every time. If he has to shake the prison and open the doors, if he has to send fire down from heaven like he did for Elijah, if he has to walk on the water to get to you, if he has to speak to the fish to vomit you out on dry land, if he has to speak to the laws of thermodynamics and cause oil not to boil John, and no matter what it is, if you're all the way in another remote part by yourself and he says, I'm going to show up with you because nothing will separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, he will come where you are. He will always honor that kind of faith. Let's pray, Lord. We need unshakable faith. I pray for this crowd tonight. God, give us that kind of faith.